Ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. Treasury yields are going the wrong way against the media narrative. We should be having a rip-roaring inflation and bond yields should be reflecting that. Instead, since, let's say, mid-March, they've gone flat. And then more recently, in the last couple of weeks, contra all expectations and surprisingly, they've been going down. What? Jeff Snyder, the head of research for Alhambra Investments, you wrote an article about a month ago that I've been meaning to get to, and we're gonna talk about it right now. And the article is, no reason to toss out low rates in the inflation debate, the repo rat rate fallacy, May 24th, 2021, Alhambra Investments. And Jeff, basically we're just gonna go back in time, step by step from 2008 and look at U.S. Treasury bond yields, and we're going to notice that they correctly predict which direction they go, but against the media narrative as to what QE is supposed to be doing. Have I done a good job setting the scene? What, how would you explain what we're going to look at? That's exactly, I mean, right now, with the yields, first of all, remaining low, and as you pointed out, since mid-March going lower, well, people have thrown up their hands and said, well, that's just because of QE. The Fed is holding rates low. That's why the bond market isn't embracing inflation because it's embracing quantitative easing purchase. And more recently, you've seen people floating around Twitter, as you say, or social media, those saying, oh, the Fed's buying more than what's being issued. And it's that purchasing that's actually influencing secondary market behavior. And so, yeah, if, if the Fed would get out of the way, then the bond market would show you that the, the last couple CPIs were just the beginning and that this is all 1970s all over again. And we can obviously, there's tons of data and evidence that shows this is the case, right? Because everybody knows the Federal Reserve controls interest rates. It gets what it wants, right? So if we pull up the charts for QE, what we're going to see is that when the Fed is buying bonds, rates must be going down. And when the Fed stops buying bonds, rates must be going up, right? That's what happens. Well, no. You have your title. The title I wrote across this uh, printout here says, QE lowers bond yields equals false God. Let's go back to 2008. <laughs> yes. And yes. it's, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such a, it's, it's almost a hardwired into the public perception, right, Emil? Mm. Everybody believes that the Fed controls interest rate. And it sounds like it should be that way. If the Fed is buying bonds, then why wouldn't bond prices go up and yields go down? And that's what the Fed wants, right? And it's, it's, it's doing all these things. But if you go back in time and you look at these things, it's exactly, almost entirely the whole way, it's exactly the opposite. When the Fed announces buying bonds and then starts buying bonds, which you see, especially in the early crisis period, going back to 2008, the bond yields rose. And so that, they to were me, falling. makes a lot of sense. Well, okay, July 2007, they had reached a peak, and then they started falling. Was the Fed buying bonds, or any central bank buying bonds during this period? No, while not during bond that period. That was, the, that was the TAF auctions and overseas dollar swaps part of the program. And it wasn't until December 2008, after the, cri the worst part of the crisis had erupted in the fall, that the Fed went to zero interest rate policy as well as announcing its quantitative easing purchase. And you can see right on the date that that was announced, the ZERP and QE, bond yields started to rise. So they had been falling during the crisis. No one was rising, buying. Rising as QE was announced, which is, again, that's, that's, that's not what's supposed to happen. Yields are supposed to go down when the Fed wants them to because that's stimulus. And what we see here is during the crisis, yields fall as things go wrong, and then they go up as it looks like maybe things are going to get better. That's really how you how you translate bond yields. Now, what about the middle of 2010? There was something happening in Greece, Jeff. Now, all of a sudden, yields were falling again, right? Or going downwards. Yeah, QE1 ended. Let's keep in mind, QE1 ended at the end of March 2010. Mm -hmm. So by April 4th, you can see within a couple days, bond yields start to fall again. Huh. Wait a minute, I mean, that's that's the opposite, right? The Fed stops buying bonds. Shouldn't bond yields go up then? Yes. No, they go the opposite way because again, you think about what yields are saying. What they're saying as they did in 2008 was the bond market was saying, 
maybe this QE stuff will work. Mm -hmm. And if it works, that means more growth and more inflation. So the, the, the bond market in the early post-crisis era actually gave the Fed the benefit of the doubt, at least for a couple months. Now you can see that kind of stopped in the summer of 2009 where the market said, well, maybe not. But still, in the early period, what, the, what bond yields were saying was that, hey, maybe this QE stuff will work. We see more inflation and more growth. Interest rates rose, bond yields rose in response to them. Then the Fed stopped doing QE1 in March of 2000, and then March of 2010, we had a bunch of other stuff happen. And then suddenly bond yields start to fall again without the Fed buying any bonds. And they hit their lows in October, at least for the uh, 10 year treasury. So you have again, the same situation where the bond, bond market is telling you, regardless of QE, things are going the wrong way. Yields falling means bad. And then in August, let's say, let's call it the autumn, of 2010, Bernanke announced, hinted, and then actually began a second QE. So if central banks are central, then bond yields should have fallen even further and faster than they had started to right around when Greece was downgraded by the American rating agency Fitch. Is that what happened? No, again, it's the exact opposite, right? What? So Bernanke shows up at Jackson Hole late in August of 2010. Wink, wink, nod, nod. We're going to do QE2 because things are going the wrong way. Don't ask any questions why, because we told you everything was fixed beforehand. And over the next couple months, up until October and early November, the signal for QE2 got stronger and stronger. But yet the bond market reacted to QE2 in the same way it had reacted to QE1. Rates more and more rose. In fact, the shorter term notes, as you can see, the two year and the five year on the chart here, they started going up exactly upon the start of QE2, hmm. which is, again, the opposite. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to be the other way. And that's it's, what it shows you is that the bond market says, well, maybe Q, if QE1 didn't do it, maybe QE2 will be enough, a little more growth, a little more inflation. But you can see how much less that already is than it had been in 2008. Yields never retraced as high as they had been earlier. So there's a little more skepticism creeping into it, but still by and large, it was that pattern. QE, maybe it works, rates go up, not down. It doesn't lower rates because bond buying isn't, it isn't really about bond buying. It isn't about the Federal Reserve at all. It's about whether or not the future contains more growth and inflation. Let us now move on to the European sovereign debt crisis, or as we sometimes refer to it, Euro dollar number two, also known as the final nail in the coffin of the post-Cold War globalization, the post-World War II order, the central banks are central era, the great moderation. This is when markets realized that once in four generation crises are happening more frequently than once in four generations. Tell us early January 2011, early 2011 was when we started to tip over again down right. yields started and to fall because the crisis had begun what you see what i didn't mark on the chart here was that qe2 ended at the end of june 2011 and hmm. oh, as you can see the the big drop the big drop in 2000 the middle of 2011 i don't know if you can highlight it on the screen there happened just after the fed stopped buying bonds mm -hmm. yep that one right there so again the Fed stops buying bonds, yields collapse, yields go down. Not because of the Fed not buying bonds or anything to do with the Fed, but because it had become apparent by then that the world was experiencing another crisis. And the reason we bring up Greece and all this is because it was repo, collateral, all that stuff that we've been talking about a lot, collateral constraint and scarcity. And that was what was causing all this monetary problems up and down the entire global system. So it didn't matter if the Fed was buying bonds, except as we know now, and we many of us had said all along, the bond buying actually makes it worse by stripping the system of collateral. But again, falling yields are not because the Fed is buying bonds. And in, every, in almost every case we see, that doesn't even matter. It's usually the opposite. It's when you see rising yields, that means more growth and inflation, falling yields, less growth and inflation, more largely because of monetary problems. So... Again, here we have another perfect example of the mainstream convention having it entirely backward, completely 180 degrees backwards. 
And as you might imagine, after going through this the second time, the reason we call this the nail in the coffin for the recovery in the post-crisis, post-2008 era, is because by then, the market had figured out that this QE stuff doesn't really have much chance of working at all. And therefore, from that point forward, you can see the reactions to QE, especially in the U.S. Treasury market, become very, very different than the first couple, uh, first couple quantitative easings. That's right. Dial it back uh, two minutes, ladies and gentlemen, and compare the slope that you saw after QE1 and QE2 to this in the yields recovering, going up, to yep. more growth, slope. more inflation. Maybe this QE stuff works. To the slope we see after Mario Draghi promised to do whatever it takes, after the Fed said they would begin an endless QE3, and then just for giggles, they added a, they changed their program from mortgage-backed securities in September to Treasuries in December. We'll call it QE4. Look at the slope. The market says, meh, they Man. didn't get excited until Ben Bernanke set, changed his mind suddenly and said, folks, we thought we were going to be doing QE until the sun exploded. But you know what? We've changed my, our mind. I think we're going to be dialing it back. That's when the market, wait a minute, it went the wrong way, Jeff. It rose? Yeah, that's the taper tantrum is misunderstood for that same reason, right? It's, it's oh, the bond market sold off because the Fed is going to be buying fewer bonds. Well, no, the bond market sold off because it, what they said was, oh, Federal Reserve officials are so confident that the recovery is proceeding in a way it hadn't up to that point that they're willing to taper their, their bond purchases that they just the year before they had said would be open-ended forever. That's what really set off, Q, set off the taper tantrum. It wasn't the tapering part. It was the reason behind the tapering, which was the projection of more growth and more inflation. So bond yields rose is sort of a belated signal. Okay, now we see a little bit more evidence that maybe this time it did work because we see the unemployment rate falling very quickly. We see economic growth, at least in the United States, starting to pick up a little bit more. So maybe this time we will go back to growth and inflation. But look at where we are on the right hand of the side of the chart compared to the left hand side. Even this so-called taper tantrum didn't bring rates back up to nearly where they were after QE1 and QE2. So even as it, as yields are going up, it's signaling higher growth and higher higher growth and higher inflation expectations, it still wasn't nearly as much. There's skepticism built into the into the equation, and as we see if going forward, when the Fed finally actually when the finally did taper in December of 2013, what happened to yields again? They went the wrong way. The Fed actually did taper, and yields started to fall throughout 2014 as the QE2 and QE3 and 4 were actually ended, and they continued to fall even further into 2015 and 2016, hitting new new lows by the time we get to 2016. Because so, that again, was the third euro dollar crisis emanating exactly. out of China. It's not about bond buying. In most cases, it's the, you know, the market behaves the opposite of the way it's supposed to, because Bond buying by the Fed doesn't really make as much difference as you're, as you're led to believe it does. The Federal Reserve is not central. It, it engages in these purchases as sort of an act of theater. It's really about, about trying to convince people that it's doing accommodative things without people really asking, well, what's being accommodated by all these bond purchases? Because it can't be lower yields because lower yields come about for other reasons beyond the Federal Reserve. And that's why, as we talked about many times before, all of these central bank studies, the best that they can come up with is, oh, if you do with this enormous QE that's 10% of GDP, maybe it lowers yields 50 basis points. That's because the market does the lowering of yields, not the bond buying. At most you can say is, well, the yields would have gone, wouldn't have gone as low as they did without the bond. That's really what they're saying. They're saying, Yields wouldn't have gone as low without QE as the as the private market said that they did. I think it was episode seventy seven. It was the twentieth anniversary of QE where we discussed that study, which came out of New Zealand. So, if anyone's interested to hear about these academic studies that look back on two decades of quantitative easing and kind of shrug their shoulders politely because they're in the economics business. So check, you know, go back to those episodes and check it out. Jeff, I guess 
what we have just discussed makes no sense if central banks are central but to money supply but if they're not central if markets are central then this makes all the sense in the world and it makes me think of that david parkins illustration with galileo at his telescope do you remember this one jeff he's yeah. at his telescope he's looking up at the moons of jupiter and he's figuring out wow moons are going around jupiter maybe this confirms what copernicus and who else was the other guy that uh, realized that the kepler that uh the earth is rotating around the sun and then you remember the david parkins illustration bernanke on his tiptoes dressed like a pope with the with the drawing in front of the telescope with the fed at the center and the currency is revolving around it and i guess jeff what is the final takeaway in case we haven't said it? If we have, we're ready to move on to part three. Well, first of all, it wasn't just one central bank study. It's all of these central bank studies that fail to come up with any kind of benefit from QE because by and large, this is what you see. Interest rates move independent of the central banks. And really, that, that really, that really cements what you're supposed to look at and what you're supposed to really focus in on here is why are interest rates moving the way they are? Regard, set aside QE, set aside the Federal Reserve or any other central bank. Understand what motivates the bond market and what motivates bond yields. When you can see and match them up with QE and say, oh, there are times when the bond market gave QE the benefit of the doubt, rising yields as the Fed was buying bonds because the market was saying more growth and more inflation, this stuff might work. And so using that framework we can thus say what's going on in 2021 this year and next year and going forward is if the bond market thought that the feds qe or you know uncle sam's helicopters or all these other things were working interest rates would rise regardless of whether or not the fed is buying bonds it's not the bond buying it's the bond market so if the if if, if there was in any way market belief or consensus that there was more growth in inflation because of all these things or even just because of random good luck hmm. interest rates would be rising the fed is not holding rates down what is holding rates down is the market perception that there is no growth there is no inflation remember where yields are right now they went from obscenely low levels to a little bit less obscene than obscenely low levels and that hasn't budged despite CPIs, despite all this QE, quote unquote, money printing, bond, bond. The, bar, the bond market is telling you it does not foresee growth and in inflation, regardless of what the Federal Reserve does. It's not the bond buying that's holding rates down. It's that, the other stuff, the lack of growth and in inflation opportunities. We didn't bring it up in this episode, but you can't go four articles if, of Jeff's work without seeing this graph comparing the slope in this re reflation to the slope of the previous reflations. And remember how you said, compare the right side of this uh, European recovery taper tantrum to where we are on the left side of the graph and how it wasn't higher. Well, that reflation, that taper tantrum was so much more than the one we're looking at right now. Again, uh, recovery, unlikely implausible the markets don't feel it jeff 15 months we've been doing this show 15 long months it feels like every single day i'm on oh i'm just joking i'm just trying to make it sound like it's exhausting it's not i love it 15 months and you know what one of the topics i don't believe we've ever discussed we're going to talk about that in, in part three and that is data revisions we're going to talk about how the economy was faring in 2017 and people are saying Wow, data revisions, what happened four or five years ago? What do I care? Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to care. It's very important. I think, I think that some people are gonna issue an expletive when they see what the data revision told us what, and what was being told to us at the time. It's gonna be very important, stick around.